Feel the power. Welcome to a Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the most exciting event on television, Riot, Righteous Invasion of Truth, presented by the Power Broadcasting Network, Abel Damina is my name i want to welcome you to the broadcast today guys listen we're going to have an exciting time in the study of god's word you know the entrance of his word give it light and it give it understanding to the simple as you come before the word of god with the simplicity of your heart ready to be equipped ready to be empowered ready to grow and ready to align with the thoughts of god the plan and the intent of god for your life Get ready, it's going to be an exciting time together today. Call a friend, call a family member, help me share the video. Let's get the word around the world. You know, as a ministry, there's a mandate of God on our lives to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's the mandate that is driving us to get this word to you every opportunity we have now listen i have an instruction clearly to set up a global discipleship academy where i'm able to disciple as many of you as are following our teachings as many of you as have been christians but nobody has discipled you discipleship it's an opportunity where somebody that is being discipled is given an opportunity to learn the fundamentals the basics the things that enables you to live out your true realities in Christ so that you're able to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, he said, all power is given to me. And then he said, you go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Discipleship is that opportunity where we're able to teach you all the things that Jesus commanded and help you align with the plan, the purpose, and the will of God for your life. We've pushed out the adverts, and I just want you not to be left out. So if you have not been discipled, you want me to disciple you, there's an email on the screen right now. If you shoot an email to that email address, we'll respond to you quickly because we're getting ready to start the classes. It's going to be online. It's global and online. We're going to give you all the details that gets you enlisted into the class. And it's a free discipleship school. You're not paying any fees. Secondly, those of you that are not able to send emails, we have a WhatsApp number from anywhere in the world. If you shoot us a WhatsApp message, we will send you all the info so you can be a part of the discipleship classes. So we're able to disciple you, equip you, empower you to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God for your life. That's how we start 2022. And thirdly, I have just come out with three books of mine and I want to encourage you to get copies of it. This one is Spirit Life. It's powerful material that helps you. Right from Genesis, the work of the Spirit has not ceased to function in and among men. The Spirit hovered over the waters and God spoke. The scriptures are replete with the work of the Spirit. So in this book, you will learn about the leading of the Spirit. You will learn about knowing how to the father leads his children. You will know about the inward witness, impressions of the Holy Spirit. Powerful book. It will change your life. The second book I just wrote is The Gift and Calling of God. There's a call of God on your life. How to locate that gifting and calling, how to steer it up and walk in the fullness of its reality. The third book is how to win in life, walking in love. The love of God that never fails. This book will equip you to walk above bitterness, strife. It will equip you to walk above all the things that the devil can offer anybody. And it will help you never to give room to the devil. These are three powerful materials that will change your life. Finally, remember I also have a book. It's called The Christocentric Meal. It's a daily devotional. And there are sermon notes that a pastor can preach in his church for three years. They are Christ-centered messages, very sound exegesis. It's called the Christocentric meal. It's on the screen. 
If you call our office or email our office to order for any of these books or all of it, I'm telling you, our office will get back to you quickly and make sure these materials get to where you are. Don't forget that our mission as a church is to equip and empower you to live out your realities in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. All right, I'm expecting to hear from you today on Discipleship Academy because classes are starting any moment from now. So don't procrastinate, don't delay. Looking forward to hear from you. Now, fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy fellowship. I want us to explore the book of Ephesians, a study in the book of Ephesians. We're going to really take time to stay with the book of Ephesians. What makes the book called Scripture, Scripture, is the testimony, the message of Christ embedded in the writing. What makes the document called Scripture, Scripture, is the message of Christ that is embedded in the writing. Why? John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The word word is the Greek word logos. In the beginning was the logos. The word logos means an idea, a mindset, a plan. Something that precedes what was said. That behind what you said, there was an idea in your mind that preceded the sayings. So an idea or a thought. So in the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was the idea. In the beginning was the mindset. In the beginning was the thought. Behind what was being said. So what was said is a byproduct of the idea, the thought, or the mindset. Verse 2 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Because he is the idea, he is the mindset, he is the thought behind what was said. The Logos of God. So everything the prophet spoke, he was the mindset behind it. The mindset of the speakings of the prophet was a person or is a person. The mindset behind the prophecy of the prophets is a person. The logos of God. So every book in the scriptures was to unveil, speak of, and testify of the person. Because he's the mindset, he's the thought, he's the idea behind. So every book that was written in the scriptures was to unveil or speak of the person. The person of the Christ. This person that we're talking about, his name in the scriptures is called the word of God. The word of God. John chapter 1 verse 1 calls him the word of God. First John chapter 1 verse 1 calls him the word of life. The word of life. He is called the word of God. First John calls him the word of life. Revelation 19 13 calls him the word of God. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So he is the logos of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 calls him the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. He's called the word of God. He's the person. He is powerful. He is quick. He is living. He is a person. He is the message. He is the thought. He is the idea or he is the living person behind what the prophet spoke. He is the reason for the prophecy of the prophets. He is the reason for the songs of David in the Psalms. He is the idea. He is the mindset. No prophet could have prophesied if he was not the reason behind it. So the prophecy of the prophets was at the instance of his thought. 
at the instance of his idea the composition of the words of the prophet he is the reason behind it the composition of the words of the prophecy he is the thoughts that preceded those prophecies am i communicating that's why he's called the logos that's why it's called the word the word of life the word of god so everybody spoke the prophet spoke what they spoke was documented or written what the prophet spoke was documented or written in a book called the scriptures what he was the idea behind the mindset behind the thought behind that the prophet spoke was documented in a book called the scriptures first peter chapter 1 verse 9 please follow me very carefully tonight receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace unto you in your bible is written of the grace that shall come that shall come is in italics of the grace that shall come is in italics the original text is the grace unto you next verse searching what or manner of time the spirit of christ which was on them, not in them, on them. Because the Old Testament prophets didn't have the spirit of Christ in them. Because they were not born again. So they didn't have the capacity to carry the spirit in. So the spirit of Christ was on them. On them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. That was the message of the prophets. The message of the prophets, the spirit on them did signify the sufferings of Christ. That was the message of the prophets and the glory that should follow. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So the message is not just mentioning Jesus. You know, because of the intensity of what we're preaching, so now some preachers who cannot really preach this message think what we are saying is that you should be mentioning Jesus. The message is not mentioning Jesus. That a man is mentioning Jesus doesn't mean he's preaching the gospel. What is the message? It is the content and the context of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That is the message. It's not the mentioning of Jesus' name. Please listen carefully. The details as revealed in the scriptures of the prophets as it regards the sufferings of Christ and the glory that follows it. That's the message. Is Christocentric. It deals with his suffering as revealed in the scriptures of the prophets. And the reason why I'm taking time to detail that is because remember, the prophet spoke at the instance of him being the idea, the reason, the mindset behind. Okay? So that means the prophecy of the prophets is loaded with the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's the message. Amen. Somebody say a good amen in the house. Yeah. The message. So it is the message that bind the scriptures together. Please follow me carefully. It is that message that binds the scriptures together. The message of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow binds the scriptures together actually that's the message of the scriptures and we're going to get into it just follow me if you catch this foundation i'm laying i'm telling you you will you will begin to unlock books in the bible without stress 
Jesus said it in Luke 24. Oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets, all that the prophets have spoken. What did the prophets speak? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's the thread that holds the scriptures together. That's the thread that holds the scriptures together. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Can I hear a powerful amen? Yeah, that's a thread that holds the scriptures together. Verse 12 of that, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, which the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things even the angels desire to look into. That means that the prophecy that the prophets gave in the scriptures we are promissory in nature. It means the prophecy of the prophets, we are promissory in nature. That is, they were pregnant with promises. The prophecies were pregnant with promises. What promises? The promises were that the Christ will suffer and out of his suffering, glory will follow. That was all that the prophecies of the prophets were weaving around. They were weaving around that word. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. That's all that the prophecy of the prophets was weaving around. Can I hear a good amen? That's what binds the scriptures together. Now, I've said it many times and sometimes some people misunderstand me and they even had to go and start trying to prepare a document to fight that statement all over the place. Hmm. Listen carefully. What we are teaching here is not CRK. You can't just catch a statement and run with it. You need the whole. Because if you take one statement, you distort what I said. Am I communicating here? No, you can't take a step. We are, we are bringing to you a holistic message. You must listen to everything and aspire to understand the whole thing. Don't just speak a statement at all. And my pity more is for TV audience who are impatient, who just flip channel to just see what they are saying and they hear a statement and they change channel and then they take that statement out of context. I feel for them because their case is very pathetic because they were wrong with error. Not from me, but from their mind. I also pity people who jump on Facebook. They see what I write and they don't read it. They assume that because the topic is familiar, they understand it so they read their thoughts into what I wrote. So then stupidly, they ask questions like people who are failing exam because they didn't read the context and the content. It may look familiar, but it is not the same thing you are thinking. That's why you must offload what you are thinking and with an open mind, read what is there. Because until then, you cannot come to a place of understanding some people even ask me questions stinking i will say a yes or no and in the scriptures questions don't have yes and no you didn't hear me questions don't have yes and no in the scriptures that is why the prayer is that the eyes of your understanding because you only understand scriptures. You don't seek for yes or no. You understand it. That means scriptures are explained and interpreted. And if you follow the explanation, in the course of explaining, you will understand the things that were raising questions. And once you understand them, your questions are naturally answered. Am I communicating here? Yeah. I said that because we're dealing with the book of Ephesians. So listen to me very carefully. <laughs> Amen. The Bible is not the word of God. Because the word of God is a person. 
The word of God is a person and the Bible is not a person. The Bible is paper and ink, but the word of God is a person. Please, if you're understanding, can I hear a living amen? The writing of the Bible is inspired by God, but not everything in the Bible is inspired of God. For example, there are people who were liars who spoke in the Bible. They were thieves who spoke in the Bible. They were rebellious people who spoke in the Bible. They were murderers who spoke in the Bible. And then God also inspired prophets to speak in the same Bible. Thieves spoke, liars spoke, rebellious people spoke, murderers spoke in the same Bible. And then God also inspired prophets to speak in the same Bible. And all of these things are jumbled together. Waiting for the man of God to rightly divide. So that's why everything is truly stated, but not everything is a statement of truth. Hence, the need for skillful Bible interpretation. Hence, the need for skillful Bible interpretation. Teaching good? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So God, through the prophet, spoke about Christ. What did the prophet speak about? Spoke about Christ. Spoke about Christ. Listen, listen to me very carefully. If everything in the Bible is correct, there will be no need for teaching. Did you hear that? If everything in the Bible is correct, there will be no need for teaching. You just carry the book and just be reading anything you see you do. The need for teaching is to be able to, to, to divide and put things in proper perspective. That's the reason for teaching. That's why you alone cannot sit at home and understand the whole Bible. You need teachers like us by the anointing of our office and by the, by the assignment on our lives to unlock the scriptures to bring you to a place of understanding. That doesn't rule out your own private study, but your private study will be at the instance of the keys we will put in your hands. Thank you, Lord. We are studying the book of what? Yeah. That's how to study it. If everything in the Bible is inspired of God, then all of us should start talking like Job. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be his holy name. We should start talking like that. But because what Job said was not inspired of God, that's why we're not speaking what Job spoke. Is that true? Somebody told me, God is not a take away. God is a giver. Say it again. God is a giver. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If God gives you something he has given you, he doesn't take back. He has blessed you. Nobody can curse you. I feel like somebody is not shouting a good amen. Somebody shout, I am blessed. Nobody can reverse it. Can I hear a powerful amen? Yeah. God is not a taker away. He's a giver. That's why the words of Job do not reflect the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't inspire those words. So knowing the difference between inspired writings and the inspiration itself is important in Bible study. Now, take note of this. From Genesis to John, but for the purpose of quick understanding, from Genesis to Malachi is where we call the scriptures. When Jesus showed up, he authenticated Moses. When Jesus showed up, he authenticated Moses. How did Jesus authenticate Moses? By quoting from Moses. Jesus began to quote from the writings of Moses. He quoted from Matthew 15, Matthew 19. In Matthew 15 and 19, he quoted Moses. In John 3, 14, he quoted from Moses. All right? Jesus also quoted from Isaiah. He quoted from Jeremiah. He quoted from Hosea. He quoted from the prophets. And on the cross, he quoted from the Psalms of David. 
my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David prophesied that prophecy in the Psalms and Jesus took the words from the mouth of David and rehearsed them on the cross, giving authenticity to the prophecy and the Psalms of David that he was the one behind it. Are you in the house? Yeah. That's why all the time he spoke, he kept quoting from their works. He kept quoting from their writings. He preached from Psalms for 40 days. He told them the books testify of me. Even in Malachi, Malachi said, a messenger shall the Lord my God send before Jesus. He spoke about the coming of John the Baptist. All right? So all the prophecies were concerning him. Can I hear your amen? Why did Jesus authenticate Genesis to Malachi? Because the message was concerning him. It was Christocentric. How many of you observed that Jesus never wrote any book? How many of you observed that? Jesus never wrote any book in the Bible. There is no book written by Jesus. Not one. In fact, the only time we see Jesus write anything in the Gospels, the only time we see Jesus write anything in the Gospels was when he wrote on the ground. And we don't know what he wrote. Are we teaching here? He never wrote any book. He never wrote any book. But he was the message that the writers wrote. Am I communicating here? He was the message that the writers wrote. Everything John, everything Luke, everything uh, Peter, uh, everything Matthew, everything Mark wrote was Jesus. Everything the prophet prophesied and was recorded was Jesus. So he didn't need to write because everybody was writing about him. So everybody said, thus say the Lord, thus say the Lord. When Jesus came, he said, verily I say, because he is the one they were quoting from. He is the Lord they were dozing from. He's the message. Somebody say, Jesus is the message of the scriptures. Say with me, the message of the scriptures is the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. I didn't hear a power city, amen. If I look at Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treatises have I written O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Next verse. Until the day in which he was taken up after that he had through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. For 40 days, he kept appearing to people to prove that he was alive. To prove that the prophecy of the prophets have happened. What was the prophecy of the prophets? That Christ will suffer and out of his suffering, glory will follow. What was the suffering of Christ? His crucifixion, his death, his burial. And his resurrection was the glory that followed. So when he appeared to people after his resurrection... He was giving evidence to them that the prophecy of the prophets have been fulfilled. Am I teaching here? So all scriptures, somebody say all scriptures, are fulfilled in the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. All scriptures. All scriptures are fulfilling that. That's the spirit of the scriptures. That's why when he rose, he spent 40 days appearing to men, establishing and authenticating the prophecy of the prophets. Why were the Gospels written? To give us a human narration of the Christ. To give us a human narration of the Christ. How do we really know that Jesus rose from the dead? Look at me, everybody. Because when you meet people that are really, 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 really satanic in their thoughts, those are the kind of questions they're going to ask you. How do you really know what is the proof that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, when he rose from the dead, he appeared to over 500 people that were confirmed they saw him. He appeared to Nicodemus. He appeared to Joseph of, of Arimathea. He appeared to Mary. He appeared to Martha. He appeared to blind Bartimaeus. He appeared to Lazarus. He appeared to all of them. He appeared to over 500 people. 
Even those that demanded to touch his hand, he gave them the hand to touch. He's alive. He's not in the grave. And they went to the grave to look for him. He was not there. He wasn't there. Until today, that tomb is empty. Not even his bones are there. Not even any sign of him is there apart from the napkin that he folded and kept for them to make them know that I am not stolen. I am the one that left this place. That's why he didn't throw the napkin. He folded it well and kept it telling them, nobody stole me. I left this place on my own accord. He's alive. Glory to God. And he's alive in me. Praise God. Glory to God. Am I blessing somebody tonight? So all the eyewitnesses wrote the scriptures spoken by the prophets to signify that it has been fulfilled. Now, from the things I've said from the beginning of this teaching, we have all agreed that the four gospels therefore were a narrative of the humanity of Christ. They were in a, that's why if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all you will keep seeing is narration, eyewitness account of what Matthew saw, Mark saw, Luke saw, John saw. Why were they written? Let's look at a few things here to help you. John chapter 20 verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through his name. Let me ask all of you a question. Where were the gospels written? Our city. Where were the gospels written? That you may believe that Jesus is the son of God. And that believing, you may have life. So the mission of the gospels is to bring people to believe that Jesus is is the son of God. That's why the gospels were written. Okay? Look at 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Same John. In the gospels, he wrote that you may believe that Jesus is the son of God and that by believing you might have life. In the epistles he wrote that you may know what you have when you believed. So the gospels are about believing Jesus so you can have life. The epistles is about knowing what you had when you believed. Am I teaching here? So the gospels therefore brings us to a place of faith while the epistles therefore brings us to a place of knowledge, epignosis. Am I teaching? If you're understanding, shout, I hear you. So John wrote to convince in John chapter 20 and in 1 John, John wrote so that those that are already convinced may come to knowledge. Look at me. It shows you, therefore, that the Bible is a book of progressive revelation. It's a book of what? Progressive revelation. So to understand the Bible, you will have to carefully read the whole Bible. Listen. To understand the Bible, you can't afford to take just one book and stay with it. You can't understand the Bible by one book. The Bible is one book. So to understand the Bible, you have to read through the whole. Because the whole Bible is one story. So if you read just one book, you don't even have up to 10% of the story. Because there are 66 books. And these 66 books are a continuation of one story. To have the complete story, you must read all. You must read all. So Bible study must be thorough. That's why Jesus... When he called them fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken to help them beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scripture because for you to read, for example, you cannot know Titan by reading Malachi. 
Malachi alone cannot give you what Titan is. If you want to really know Titan, you must start from Genesis and begin to travel through the scriptures as it regards the subject of Titan to Revelation. When you have read through, that is when you can now say, I know about Titan. One verse is not enough. Let me tell you something, Pastor Praise. The Lord told me this. He said to me, son, you will never know how stingy Christians are stingy even you you never know how stingy you are but you will know it now because i'm going to show you and those of you watching you think you're not stingy you are very stingy you you are very stingy somebody said to me why do you say we're very stingy? The Lord spoke to me. <laughs> Not just power city. The church world is a stingy world. I asked God why. He said to me, son, do you realize when you were preaching in power city that if they don't pay their tithe, devourers will come on them. If they don't pay their tithe, things will be tight. When you are preaching that if they don't pay their tithe, there is a cause on the work of their hands. When you are preaching that if they don't pay their tithe, life will be very hard. When you are preaching those messages, you say, son, do you realize they were paying their tithe religiously? There were people that paid tithe steadily, steadily, and religiously. I said, yes, Lord. Then he said to me, do you realize that when you told them that whether they pay tithe or not, they are blessed, all of them stop paying tithe? I said, yes, Lord. He said, they never give to me. They gave in to their fear. All their givings were not to me. They were given to feed their fear because they were afraid of devourers. They were afraid of things going tight. They were afraid of the unknown. So when you scare them with those messages and get them certain scriptures, out of fear, they give, not out of faith. And what is not of faith is sin. So all their giving was a sin. He told me, tell them. They couldn't play with their tight. Their tight book was in their handbag. As they are moving, the moment somebody gives them money, they remove. He said to me, they never gave because they love me. They gave because they were afraid of their future. So they never gave in faith, they gave in fear. And he says to me, you never know how stingy church people are until the day you tell them that whether they pay tight or not, there is no more devourer. Then their stinginess will come out. Because then all of a sudden, there's no more need to give. Then he said to me, son, I don't want people to give to me out of fear. I want people to give to me out of faith and understanding and love. And I said to the Lord, speak to me some more. Then the Lord gave me an illustration. He said to me, can you imagine a man that has been kept in a slave market waiting for somebody to buy him and he doesn't know from anywhere somebody is coming to buy him from. He's just hopeless and helpless in the slave market. Hopeless and helpless in the slave market. And then somebody shows up and pays for him. And after the person pays for him, the person brings him home as a slave. Then the person looks at him and says, you are a slave, but I free you. Go and enjoy your life as a free citizen. No, sir, you bought me. I'm supposed to serve you forever. No, I know you're supposed to, but on my own free will, I release you with every right and privilege as a free man in the society. Go. He said, then the slave now turns to say, sir, even though you have freed me to go and live my life, I have deliberately also decided to be your slave. I want to serve you forever. He said, that's how I want people to serve me. That I have freed you to go. But you turn and say, Lord, you are too good to me. I want to serve you as a slave. It is called bond slave. Paul called himself a bond slave. Now I know that whether I pay tight or not, the virus will not come. Now based on that knowledge, I will increase my giving. Because I'm no more giving under obligation. I'm giving under appreciation. Lord, 
If it were not for you, where will I be? We are still in Ephesians. Are we in Ephesians? Some say, but you have not read anything in Ephesians. No, no, no. What I'm showing you now, if you understand it, when we enter Ephesians, the book will open. If you don't understand what I'm saying now, we can be in Ephesians reading the way you used to read. And we will get resolved the way you used to get it. So I'm helping you understand because the Bible is one book. It's just one book. The Bible is not books. It's not books. It's a book. It's a book that has just one story. The Bible doesn't have stories. It's one story. And to know the story, you must read from the beginning to the end because the whole of it is, if you take one section out, you don't have the complete story. You don't have the complete story. The whole Bible is a story. Story of one man. There's only one character in the Bible and one message. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. The whole Bible has a central theme that cannot be understood by reading only one book. You must read everything. That's why Paul commended Timothy for knowing the scriptures. He says that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. Timothy knew the whole scriptures as a child. Because that's the only way you can say you know the scriptures. When you read all of it and understand all of it. What is the understanding you require of the Bible? That it is just one message with one character. Christ. And until you understand that, then you're in trouble. I preach all over the world and I tell them, stop asking God to fulfill the scriptures in your life. The scriptures are not about you. The scriptures are not about you. Stop asking God to fulfill the scriptures in your life. The scriptures are not about you. The scriptures are about Christ. And do you realize when Jesus stood on that cross and said, it is finished. John 19, 30. What did he mean by it is finished? It is fulfilled. It is completed. What is fulfilled and what is completed? The prophecy of the prophets. What was the prophecy of the prophets? Christ will suffer and out of his suffering, glory will follow. So on that cross, was the beginning of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Which prophecy of his suffering and of the glory that will follow. How? See him on the cross. And from that cross he's not coming down. From that cross he will die. From that death he will be buried. From that burial he will resurrect. From that resurrection all scriptures are fulfilled. Am I communicating? So all the scriptures are already fulfilled in Christ. How do you come in if any man be in Christ? What is in Christ? Fulfill scripture. So if any man be in Christ, where is he? In the fulfilled scriptures. So if the scriptures are fulfilled and you are in the fulfilled scriptures, what part do you play? You receive the blessing that came from the fulfilled scriptures. You become a beneficiary of what his death, his burial, his resurrection has provided. Am I talking here? What has his death, burial, and resurrection provided? Righteousness. What has it provided? Justification by faith. What has it provided? Grace and the abundance of it. What has it provided? Holiness and sanctification. Jesus is made unto us. Righteousness and holiness and wisdom and sanctification. How do we come in? We believed in what he did and what he did became what we did. Accepted in the beloved. Teaching good? The book of Ephesians. That's where we're going. I've had some people say, well, God just gave me a rhema. No. A rhema doesn't mean a word that came from God. A rhema means what the prophet spoke at each time in history. That's the meaning of rhema. What is Logos? Logos means when you put together everything that God spoke through the prophets, all of it put together is called Logos. What is Rema? What God spoke through the prophets as documented in the scriptures. What is Logos? What all the prophets spoke that is put together is called the Logos of God. Am I teaching here? 
And you can't know the mind of God until you read the whole Bible. You can't know the mind of God until you read. Can I give you an example? Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Very strong scriptures. Then he now say, go into the world. How can you say, love not the world? Then you say, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Then in the same scripture, you now say, go to the world. Then in the scripture, you now say, for God so loved the world. And then he says, you shouldn't be their friend, but he's loving them. And he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Then he himself said, for God. Uh-uh. It seems like a contradiction everywhere. There's no contradiction at all. No contradiction. It's just that the statements were made depending on the context in which discussion was going on. So the world means different things. The world is not the same thing. Where he said love not the world, he was talking of a different thing. Where he said God love the world, he's talking of a different thing. Where he says you're of, in the world but not of the world, he's talking of a different thing. So that is why to have the whole picture of this whole thing, you must read everything. When you read everything, you can now contextually have an understanding of the scriptures. Am I teaching here? You don't just pick things around. No, the Bible is not meant to be read like that. The Bible is not meant to be studied like that. We study to come to a place of understanding that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Somebody growing tonight, shout, I'm growing. Yeah, growing in knowledge. Do you know that you can never know about marriage in the Bible by reading one verse of scripture? You must read from Genesis to Revelation on marriage to have a complete understanding of the subject of marriage. It's not just one verse you pick. Wife, submit to your husband. I'm warning you. Even God approve. No, no, no. Don't, don't pick one verse that massages your emotions and stay with it. You have to see the whole picture because if you were a good student, if you had read a little longer, you will see that at a point he, he didn't even talk about wife submit. He said submitting yourselves to one another. That's husband and wives. But depart. What is iniquity? Sin. What kind of sin? What kind of sin can be iniquity? Huh? Huh? The rejection of Christ? You try. What is iniquity? Huh? See, if you stay with that verse, you will leave Jesus and go and kiss Satan. If you stay with that verse, because that verse will confuse you. So that's why in Bible study, there is a rule. What is the rule? Pretext, post-text, then context. So what will be the pretext of this verse? Well, let's go a few verses before it. So let's start from verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of truth. Next verse. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. What will increase to more ungodliness? Profane and vain babblings. People talking about what they don't know. Next verse. And their word. So profane and vain babbling is word. It's a form of communication. And their word will eat as though a canker of whom is Hymnios and Philetus. So there were two people that were already operating these profane and vain babblings as recorded in the scripture. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And what did that result to? They overthrew the faith of some. Next verse. Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth those that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from what? Iniquity. Next verse. 
posted. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Next verse. If any man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. All right, next verse. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So another powerful word, youthful lust. What is youthful lust? Well, to understand what youthful loss is, we continue reading. Next verse. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, opt to teach and patient. So now the question is, what is iniquity? It's false teaching. It's false teaching. When he was saying, let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity, what he's saying is, depart from false teachers. From wrong doctrine. But if you don't read contextually, you will start talking of fornication and adultery here now. Iniquity, stealing. But the iniquity here is wrong teaching. But it will take contextual study to know what we're talking about. Am I teaching good? What is youthful lust? In this context, youthful loss is the greed of young people trying to teach a new thing from the Bible that does not agree with doctrine. That's why I say there are some that have taught that the resurrection is past. They are greedy for new teaching that does not agree with sound doctrine. It is called youthful loss or youthful desire to express new knowledge that is not in agreement with sound doctrine. Are we teaching here? That's why adequate Bible study is important. Very important. So you don't make the Bible say what the Bible is not saying. So Paul said to Timothy, I know from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Not just a book of the Bible. You have known everything that is in the Scriptures called Scriptures. From a child, Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make the word wise through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So it's important to go contextual in order for us to understand how to apply the message of the scriptures. Amen. I said amen. So Ephesians chapter 1, let me just give you that as we close. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints. Are the saints in this building? Where are the saints? Alright, to the saints which are at power city and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. I thought you would shout amen. amen. Peace from God our Father. I thought you would shout amen. amen. I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will bless us? Are you blessed? If you are blessed, shout blessed. Yes. Who hath blessed us with some spiritual blessings? Oh. How many blessings? Oh. All spiritual blessings where? In heavenly? Where is heavenly? In Christ. You are blessed with all. Somebody shout, I am blessed with all. Somebody say, I cannot be cursed. I am too blessed. The blessing of God is upon my life. It make it rich and no sorrow is added. I thought your amen will slap the devil. I declare over you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will never see anything called sorrow. Amen. If you stand up and shout that amen, you are far from sorrow. Amen. You are far from oppression. Amen. You are far from evil. Amen. You are far from terror. You are far from error. Amen. If your amen is louder, you are far from error. Amen. Somebody shout, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places say i am a saint in christ i am righteous in christ i understand the message of the scriptures it is the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow say i am part of the glory 
that followed that suffering. Can I hear powerful amen? amen. The Bible says through his death, burial, and resurrection, he has brought many sons unto we are glory. You are part of that glory. You are not a minus, you are a plus. You are not defeated, you are more than a conqueror. I declare over you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are established. You are far from oppression. You are established. You are far from oppression. You are established. You are far from oppression. Receive wisdom. Ideas. Receive wisdom. Ideas. Receive wisdom. Ideas. Receive wisdom and ideas. And in the name of Jesus, receive the capacity to interpret it. It is done. It is done. In Jesus' precious name. Can I hear that amen like thunder? Go ahead and give Jesus a praise. Glory. Celebrate. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I believe you've been affected and impacted by the word of God. Now, I decree and I declare that the word you receive today, revelation knowledge keeps increasing in your heart you will walk in these realities and you will live an overcomer's life in jesus name amen now remember there's the global discipleship academy and registration is going on right now it's a free online academy where i equip you and train you on the basics the fundamentals that helps you to live out the riches of redemption. If you have never been discipled before, even if you're in a church somewhere, you've never been discipled before, you've been a Christian, nobody has discipled you before. Oh my goodness, this is your opportunity. You know, discipleship doesn't mean you're a new Christian. It just means that we're able to take you through certain rudiments that also empowers you to disciple other people in the knowledge of Christ. Second Timothy 2 to Paul says to Timothy, the things you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. So if you want to join the academy today, don't procrastinate. There's an email address on the screen. You can shoot an email to us right now. And also, there's a WhatsApp number. You can shoot a WhatsApp request and we're willing to quickly make sure you are enlisted in the Global Discipleship Academy. It's an opportunity you don't want to miss at all. Tell other people about it because this is very, very critical and crucial because the foundation of your Christian life is very critical. It determines everything that you do as a child of God. Secondly, my books are available. I want to encourage you to order for them. There's a phone number and there's an email. These are my new books, How to Win in Life, Walking in Love. The second one is The Gifts and Calling of God. The third one is Spirit Life. These are new. They just came out. They will empower and equip you to walk in victory. Also, there's a Christocentric meal, our daily devotional material. And you can also use it as a pastor for sermon notes in your church for three good years without repeating any message. It's a tool that empowers and equips you to fulfill your ministry effectively. We love you guys. Always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Till I come back to you again on this same platform, enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Amen.